This is the, uh, the uh, emergence of the U.S. as a world power, part eight. Uh, basically, the main part of the Spanish-American War. It uh, the war lasted about four months, from April to August, <coughs> the year 1898. Now, the land operation by the U.S. military involved trying to surround and uh, the port city of Santiago de Cuba and forced the Spanish fleet to um, evacuate that place. It was successful. Some of the main fighting involved the capture of two hills uh, that we had to be taken in order to finish surrounding the city on the land side, uh, San Juan Hill and Kettle Hill. And um, of course, this was heavily reported in the newspapers because everybody wanted to read about it. But um, involved in that was the first U.S. volunteer cavalry, or functionally uh, infantry, uh, captured one of the hills. The other was captured by <clears throat> two units of black troops, the Buffalo Soldiers. They've been part of the U.S. Army since the uh, Civil War, though they remained segregated from the white soldiers and commanded by white officers. The, uh, the black troops were always the, the most perfect and professional of all the troops in the U.S. Army because they understood that anything short of perfection would be taken as proof of racial inferiority. They weren't going to let that happen. In fact, they had uh, considerable contempt for these white amateurs out there. So um, there are so many reports in the newspapers, some of it's contradictory, it's hard to separate fact from fiction. But uh, um, I'm not even completely sure, since I've heard it both ways, whether Roosevelt's Rough Riders, who uh, ran up a steep hill guarded not by Spanish troops but by German mercenaries armed with machine guns, and captured San Juan Hill while the black troops captured Kettle Hill, it could be that the uh, U.S. Army, U.S. Volunteers led by Roosevelt captured um, Kettle Hill and then participated in the charge up San Juan Hill. Big deal. The main thing is this was so heavily reported and Roosevelt was such a fascinating and already high profile figure that this uh, military action would transform him into a kind of political superstar and he would capitalize on that immediately. I posted a video, which is a clip, uh, it's around 10 minutes or so, but from an extremely well done TV movie uh, done in 1997 called The Rough Riders. It was done by a network that I think has a new name now, then it was called TNT. And they did several, I thought, outstanding <coughs> um, history-based TV movie. So this one, this is just the, the charge up the hill with Roosevelt played by Tom Berenger. And it's supposed to be some of the better combat footage ever, ever enacted. You can't really expect full realism from a movie. Movies do not exist to inform you. They exist to entertain you. So you would take it. This was a, this a TV movie. If you can find it, it's, uh, it's worth a look. And they keep cutting away to this wounded man lying near a tree, and a younger man is describing the battle. The younger man is an actor playing a writer named Stephen Crane. Uh, that name may be familiar. Stephen Crane's fame was based on his authorship of a Civil War novel entitled The Red Badge of Courage. Now, Crane was not, Crane was born five years after the Civil War ended published the novel when he was still just in his 20s. In fact, he died at the age of 29. He's a heavy drug user. But <coughs> Civil War combat veterans who read that book generally said that was the most accurate book they'd ever read about the Civil War. Amazing. Anyway, um, I recommend that particular footage for you. Okay, anyway, the encirclement of Santiago is completed. Uh, the Spanish admiral reluctantly obeyed orders to, to um, haul up his anchors and make a run for it. <coughs> so he sails out into Santiago Bay into the teeth of the U.S. Uh, Atlantic fleet and all his ships are systematically sunk. This time the Americans did have one casualty. One of the sailors 
died of a heat stroke. Okay, after that, things calmed down. On like August 12th, simultaneously, American troops arrived and began landing in Manila and the Philippines <coughs> and in Puerto Rico. Meanwhile, we had uh, taken Guam from the Spanish story there. I don't have time to tell you what you get. Um, but the next day, August 13th, Spain called for a ceasefire and negotiations. Um, this whole thing, why did they do this? They really had no particular hope. Even with the U.S. Army in a fairly lame condition, this, 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 this was, was this a war or was this Mike Tyson mugging a quadriplegic? Hard to tell. Um, one little vignette from, from action in the Philippines after the Army got there, there was a Spanish fort which negotiated a surrender. The commander negotiated a surrender and one of the terms he demanded was that the American troops had to attack his fort. Shots would be exchanged, casualties would be sustained, but after a certain amount of time, the Spanish commander would surrender. It was all agreed upon. It was all staged. Real blood, real guts. That, in a way, is a metaphor for the entire war. You don't just walk away from a 400-year-old empire without at least making some semblance of a fight, even if you know you have no chance. So there you go. Anyway, this was a short war. It lasted about four months. Uh, the U.S. suffered less than 500 combat casualties in the war. Uh, the Army, which had been sent to Cuba in woolen uniforms to sweat out a Caribbean summer, um, and they're just ripped through by, by tropical diseases. The Army was in quarantine on an island in New York Harbor where they shivered through the next winter wearing the lightweight, tropical weight summer uniforms that finally showed up just in time. The U.S. Army suffered 10 times as many uh, deaths to disease as they did to, uh, to combat. But this war is accompanied by just a, an eruption of patriotic fervor and emotion and feeling and expression um, that's disproportionate. It's disproportionate to the war at large. Something else is going on here. There's more here than meets the eye. It's not too hard to figure out. What is the elephant in the room? Here it is. The Spanish-American War was the first time that Northerners and Southerners had gone into battle side by side under the same flag. So a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of baggage left over from the Civil War is being dealt with here. And there's, there's, a, there's a whole reunification effort that's going on. It's not an effort, it's just an, an, an event that accompanies this. So uh, this war was a big step toward the, the, the reunion of North and South. Most people have no idea how long the South cherished their hard feelings, not so much from losing the war, but what was done to them during Reconstruction after the war they thought was so unfair. Um, we had a president born in the South. We'll get to him later in this unit. His name was Woodrow Wilson. He was born in Virginia, grew up around Atlanta, uh, and there, with his own impressionable six-year-old eyes, he witnessed the destruction wrought by General Sherman's Union Army as they came through. Made him a lifelong pacifist. But um, he went to college in New Jersey. He went to Princeton, and he later said that when he got to Princeton, it was the first time he'd ever heard the song, The Star-Spangled Banner. They did not play that song in the South. They didn't observe Fourth of July in the South. There's one, I think it was South Carolina was last. They did not resume celebrating Independence Day until World War II in the 1940s. Okay, one more story. There's uh, troops headed for the headed for the conflict, and I think they might have been marching through a southern town. And the people are all out there watching the troops go by. And the story goes, and this is just a little tearjerker of a story. 
Here's a, a grandfather and his little grandson. The grandfather's put on his old Confederate uniform. They're standing there on the street corner, and the little boy looked, watched the soldier and said, Grandpa, aren't those Yankees? And the grandfather said, Those are Americans, son. I like that. <laughs> okay. Well, this was supposed to be a war to liberate Cuba, and we liberated Cuba, but we didn't stop there. The uh, isolationists should have looked at this in a bit broader scale. We acquired, immediately as a result of the peace settlement, we acquired Puerto Rico, which is still in American territory. We acquired an island called Guam out in the Western Pacific. Um, we're going, we pledged to liberate Cuba. It would take, you know, upwards of a decade for everybody to let them go. They have no experience in self-government. And there is the matter of the Philippine Islands. It's a large archipelago in the southwestern Pacific. And it has a total population of around 7 million completely alien people who are not just alien from us, they're alien from each other. There are assorted ethnicities, religions, languages, lots of Catholics, lots of Muslims, one of the largest Muslim countries. No hint of a background for them. Um, self-government. Anyway, the story continues. American troops arrive there and with the assistance of Filipino freedom fighters, we secure the capital city of Manila. But then the Filipinos learn that we're not leaving. Now this stuff, go back to America for just a minute. President McKinley's going to call the shot on what we do with the Philippines. He's got, it's like a multiple choice question with three options and they're all wrong. Wrong answer number one, back away and let Spain attempt to continue governing the Philippines. That didn't help anybody. The Filipinos would be crushed by that. They'd be very angry, disappointed. Spain couldn't afford the Philippines. Spain's washed up. It's halfway around the world. It's only pride is the only reason to hang on to it. That's the wrong answer. Another wrong answer that would look like the right answer, and that would be after a certain uh, apprenticeship and self-government, walk away and let the Philippines govern themselves. What makes that the wrong answer? They not only have no experience in self-government, they don't even have a common language. You know what the official language of the Philippines is today? English. They have a made-up language called Tagalog that they also use. Plus, they can't maintain their independence. The whole world is a shark tank of hungry imperialists and Philippine Islands are like a minnow. They would have been snapped up the next day by either the Brits or the Germans, probably the Germans. So that's the wrong answer. The third answer is both the right one and the wrong one. Stay there permanently and maintain the Philippines as a colonial possession, an imperial possession. Looks terrible. Worst one for us, actually. It really was. Ended up being the best for the Filipinos. Now, McKinley chose that option. He was a devout Methodist. He informed his advisors, finally, that having prayed about it at great length, he saw no alternative to keeping them all so, in that form, it went to the Senate for ratification, and there is a big fight. And uh, the opposition to this came from several, sometimes groups, sometimes just viewpoints, who opposed this. And if I were to ask you an essay question, were you going to summarize the isolationist as opposed to imperialist viewpoint? This is where you'd find it. And I'm going to get caught straddle in the middle of this before I'm done. You know what? I'm going to come back to this in a part nine. Because I've got less than a minute left. Couldn't do anything with that. So, hi-de-ho. I'll see you in a minute.